Hey, this is Harry Siegel with the uh, Daily News. I'm here with my colleague Sally Goldenberg of Capital New York uh, to talk Hi. about Mayor Bill de Blasio. Um, Hi. Hey, Sally. So hey. this has been a, this has been something I, I think of a more difficult week for him. Uh, there was there was the whole snow kerfuffle when he uh, didn't yes. cancel school. There is the bishop, which is uh, uh, evidently a non-story. Uh, according to every de Blasio ally, this is the uh, the fellow who ended up uh, who, who w w had a, a turn and no turn signal was arrested. The mayor put in because he had a couple of outstanding warrants for protests. The mayor put in a call and he was released shortly thereafter, which which is right. a little thing. But the sort of disciplined refusal of anyone involved to answer questions has uh, has really, I think, uh, set the press on the scent of this. And pre-K, I'm still not sure where that's going in Albany. We can just ignore the sort of out of the blue proposal for a minimum raise hike that would also have to go through Albany. But, uh, right. you know, are, 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 is this the sign of tougher times to come or just sort of adjustments and growing pains as, uh, as, as the new mayor settles into office and is still slowly appointing staff and so on? A couple of things. I mean, I think the relationship with Cuomo is not growing pains so much as a uh, you know the beginning of what you're going to see for the rest of the year. Cuomo has to get reelected this year. His emphasis and his interest is not going to be in the city so much where he's doing well or expected to do well. It's going to be upstate. He's not going to raise all signs say he's not going to allow a uh, a tax hike for pre-K. And since De Blasio's dug in on that, that's going to be an ongoing fight. And I think. Yeah, as you said, minimum wage was sort of randomly mentioned in State of the City. I think de Blasio did it to check a box, and it fits in with his, you know, whole inequality theme. But it's certainly it's the last thing on Cuomo's mind, right? So I don't think that relationship is going to get better once de Blasio settles in. I think it's just sort of going to be fraught throughout. Um, I think the the bishop. I think Rudy Giuliani even called it a rookie mistake. That's how I interpreted it. You know, I think I've talked to a number of council members and I asked them off the record, you know, do you, you know, would you do this kind of thing? And in conversation, they all said, yes. But they're council. And I think, that, I mean, I'm, and that's, well, that's why I say growing pains. I, I, I think, I, yes, I, exactly. It's one thing for a councilman. It's one thing for a public advocate. And it's totally different when you're mayor. And I think that was a rookie mistake. If he does it again, and it's a pattern, he's going to have a huge problem. If he stays away from this sort of thing and realizes now that, like, as mayor, you can't do it, then I think we can chalk it up to an early mistake. I guess it depends on whether he does something similar in the future. Right. So, so interesting question. Like, the, the commissioner, Bill Braddon, who is not a press-shy man, and has no. been, you know, active on Twitter over the last couple of days and otherwise out there, but has not said a word about this. And I mean, the story is basically, you know, the Blasio calling Kim Royster, who, who's now a deputy chief, but, but works right. in the, the public information department there and proceeds Brandon to check out what's going on. Um, if I remember right, Rudy in his comment said, you know, I, I would have called the commissioner. You know, it's fine. Just, that, that was sort of his, his, his quick aside. Like, right. is, is, does that mean something or is that just uh, uh, the way the week's going? It, it's it's I can't I really know. recall Braddon disappearing for a week on end. And he wasn't at the Snow press conference. Right. Um, and I don't think he's, they said he hasn't been at all of them. I, he's definitely been at some of them. I'm not sure about all of them. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what to make of his role or lack thereof in this. I don't, you know, I just don't know um, whether someone contacted him, whether they bypassed him, who leaked it. You know, I, I don't know. So it's hard to tell whether, there's some sort of freezing between the mayor and the police commissioner. It depends on what happened behind the scenes there. But, you know, that's just information I don't have. So I, it's hard to tell. And going back to uh, Cuomo, so, so Fred Dicker had a column in the Post today so, sort of laying out his, uh, as Dicker sees it, his, uh, his upstate strategy, that he's going, to, he's going to do blockbuster well in the city this year, Cuomo, right. no matter what. So all of his policies are sort of aimed at, at appealing to upstaters who, who uh, have a very different economy and, and are, are, are 
angry at this point and, and where, where Cuomo's poll numbers don't look so good, where, where he's, he's like 50-50 with an Astorino or a Trump. Um, at the same time, I know Cuomo's people are very fond of noting that they got more votes in New York City uh, when, in, when he last ran for Bill office than, than, than de Blasio did this year, like sort of pushing back on the idea of, of a mandate. And so I think for a lot of New Yorkers who aren't paying super close attention, it's confusing that you have the, the, this progressive icon, maybe second to Elizabeth Warren now, who's running New York and this, uh, this, this very much of a centrist third wave Democrat who's running New York State, uh, both of whom seem to be vastly popular. And, and can, you help, uh, can you help square that circle? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I th- actually, I read Fred's column. I thought it made a lot of sense. And I think the way you just summed it up is on point. I think you have a different electorate. So Cuomo has to appeal to, you know, a broader constituency, not just New York City. Um, and I think that's why he's not going to do the tax hike for pre-K. That's why he's probably not going to do minimum wage. That's why he's not going to give in to de Blasio's agenda, because he can't, you know, and please his broader constituency in an election year. And de Blasio doesn't want to give in and look like he's just, you know, throwing his hands up because of that. So that's that's the divide you're just going to keep seeing. And as far as, you know, it's true, turnout was remarkably low last year. I think that, I think the electorate was nonplussed by the candidates and de Blasio ran the smartest and most disciplined campaign in a field where no one was really exciting too many voters. And that's what you saw. Which is interesting because I think a lot of New Yorkers experienced it that way. And then this became a national story, sort of New York's return to its uh, progressive roots. The, 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 what was not a campaign that I don't think generated tremendous excitement here uh, outside of core democratic circles, I think, I think was, was became red hot in those. And then, and then, uh, and then became a national narrative outsized to, uh, it's impact yeah, I agree city. with you. I, I agree with you completely. I, I think the narrative doesn't match. I don't, I, I didn't sense a tremendous amount of excitement in the city. I think people liked de Blasio. As I say, and I mean, it was, it was sort of, people viewed it as kind of a bland, unimpressive field, rightly or wrongly. And he ran, in my opinion, the smartest and certainly most disciplined campaign and had the clearest message and had a surge at the right time. But yeah, I I agree with you. I don't think there was a level of excitement in New York City that matched the national narrative. And I think a lot of that had to do, I think a lot of the reason that national reporters were into this is because Bloomberg was mayor for 12 years. And there were so many things about his mayoralty that was, you know, fascinating and different and unique. And the end of that is really the story people were talking about. So when de Blasio is claiming uh, this, this overwhelming mandate now, and he crushes Republican Joe Luda in the general, um, this being an overwhelmingly Democratic city, um, is he overplaying his hand? Is he very smartly using... Uh, use, he's using, using a number... Yeah, I mean, he's using numbers he was given, and, and he has every right to say that, and the numbers work in his favor, but it's it's a little bit intellectually dishonest to make it sound as though the entire city has been clamoring for what he's talking about. The voters, and look, I think Clyde Haberman said on New York One um, a month or so ago that, like, you know, I don't remember the quote, but basically it's up to those who vote to determine, you know, the majority who vote determine that mandate. Mm -hmm. And so the people who showed up said they want the glossy on that spot, but a lot of people who didn't show up probably don't agree, you know, in the outer boroughs and the more conservative Dems, they probably don't agree wholeheartedly with his platform. But he has the right to say it, sure. I mean, he won by 50 points in the general. So one of the uh, few places where, uh, where where Joe Loda won was the Upper East Side in Manhattan, mm-hmm. which seems to have become a, uh, a bastion of righteous uh, indignation about the mayor, particularly when it comes to snow, also garbage, and, and a few other issues. Um. <sighs> The snow day and Al Roker's uh, critique of it, his daughter, I believe, goes to <laughs> LaGuardia, became became a huge story that really threw me off because we have so few snow days. Right. Just, just I, I, the mayor, the mayor repeated the number. Forgive me if I, I'm mistaken. This was something like eleven in the last thirty years. Um, yeah, thirty-five years or something like that. And 
the people who seemed the most outraged about this, uh, including including my parents and uh, Al Roker, <laughs> uh, were exactly the sort of people who, if they have kids in the system, can easily pull their kids out, not have, you know, not have them go in for a day, get babysitting if needed, depending on their age. Whereas people who are maybe not as active on Twitter or, or playing as big a role in the conversation who, who need to go to work, um, who it's really difficult to get childcare too late, we seemed, seemed out of it. There seemed to be a disconnect where, where, where to me at least, the mayor there was speaking very reasonably and sanely about the, uh, about the city and the, his critics and then the press corps asking questions about it on that Thursday were just locked in on the idea, like, how could you not cancel school? Yeah, I think the problem is... Sorry. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, New York never... My parents were both public school teachers, and when I was a kid, they were never off. I mean, I don't think in my whole life they had a snow day. Maybe they had, like, one snow day or something. So, or at least that I can remember. It was... The point being, it was very rare. And I was surprised by the level of anger, but I think that there's a sense that he botched one snowstorm and he's sort of, you know, he's new, he's a new mayor and he has been dealing with a number of snowstorms and people are frustrated with it. And I think that there was just a lot of built up frustration and not a lot of goodwill, you know, on the other side of the ledger. Right. So people are just annoyed. They're annoyed about the snow. They're annoyed about the weather, I guess. I don't know. I guess there there was more snow than the Blasio thought there would be. Only up to the press so, conference, it was there was more snow on the front end, and so when people were asking questions, right. there was this outrage, and then and then there was much less snow on the back end than was expected. Right. To, so it actually turned into but a was, fairly nice day, with with all respect. Yeah. To the <laughs> but at the point at which people were driving to school, it was bad. It was terrible. And I guess you had that you know no pun intended, but like a perfect storm where you had the snow at the wrong time. And just snow fatigue, and not as I said, not a lot of goodwill built up yet because you know he's only been in office for six weeks, and he botched one snowstorm pretty badly right. and publicly apologized for it. So he just didn't have he didn't have goodwill there. And on the Upper East Side was the outrage area. Uh, the the, the yeah. plows did not come through quickly enough, and was he punishing his uh, political enemies? <laughs> right, right. Sally, I know you've got to uh, you've got to go to actually cover the city in a minute, but let me ask you: We get to the end of this year, I, more so than, than than when De Blasio came in. We have a path now. We've got a, a budget. We, we sort of know the issues on the table, pre K, at the top of that list. Um, the idea of sort of upping wages for people at the bottom, but but what are the terms that that De Blasio and in relation to Cuomo should be judged by? Like like uh, if this is a good year for De Blasio, what does it look like? If it's a good year for Cuomo, what does it look like? Well, Cuomo has to win re-election and show that he has the upper hand in his relationship with de Blasio. And so far, both those things are looking to be working in his favor. I mean, those aren't the only things he has to do, but I'd say those are the, the main things, you know, vis-a-vis the city. Uh, I think, you know, it's tricky with de Blasio because his, his broad platform is just that. It's broad and it's vague. It's ending income inequality or closing the income gap. There's... Not a ton a mayor can do about that. And so it's a lot of rhetoric that he's not going to be able to match with reality simply because, you know, his job won't allow him to do so. And his his um, his agenda when he ran was pretty broad. And, you know, that's how all candidates are. They promise everyone everything. He's not going to get it all done. That's just impossible. So I, mean, I think he needs to be able to chip away and check the box on a few key things. He, he's already ended the appeal on stop and frisk. He needs to show those numbers continuing to decrease without a rise in crime. Because if, if the numbers come down on the stops, but crime goes up, it's not going to be considered a clean victory. And he needs some form of pre-K by September. I mean, if it's not the tax, that will be something of a loss because there are people who like the sort of, you know, the ideology behind taxing the rich, but if you can get universal pre-K, then that can be considered a victory without the tax, but that's going to be really tricky. Mm -hmm. You know, he has to rely on the state for a quote-unquote blank check, and he really needs to make gains in affordable housing. He's promised 200,000 new units over 10 years. He's got to start that, and he hasn't so far. So he's got, he's got a lot, you know, he's got a big agenda. On pre-K, I think when we're all done talking, that if every kid who wants a full day slot can have one in September, that's a huge win for him. 
And if that is not the case, and, and we're going out and finding these parents who, who really need it and can't have it, that, that's a big loss. I think more than how it's paid for. I agree with you. I just I think the reason he's dug in on the tax is that there are people who want to see the wealthier pay more. I mean, otherwise, he wouldn't have made that such a big part of the platform. It would have been universal pre-K without such an emphasis on that. But, but I agree. I think, I mean, if there is a full implementation of pre-K, then, yeah, then he can definitely declare a victory on that. It's going to be, it will be a lively and interesting year. Um, for sure. Sally, thanks a lot for, uh, thanks a lot for talking some of this through, and uh, we'll see. Okay, thanks, Harry. Thanks for having me. Bye.